Welcome to the Safety Doc Podcast with your charismatic host and prominent safety expert, Dr. David Perodin. Be entertained and informed as the Safety Doc discusses both best and bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. The truth will keep you safe. Follow Dr. Perodin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Safety Doc Podcast. I am your host, David Perodin. This is an extended length interview with economist and author Aaron Clary. From time to time, I will feature interviews that go beyond the typical 60-minute length of the show. For those of you listening on the 405 Media, this show will end at the 60-minute mark. But if you visit the405media.com, click on Partners, then The Safety Doc, you can find Episode 32 and listen to the show in its entirety. Aaron and I discussed his recently published book, Reconnaissance Man, and his published essay, Poor Richard's Retirement. Both are available through Amazon.com. You can visit his website, CaptainCapitalism.blogspot.com. Again, CaptainCapitalism.blogspot.com to learn about all of Aaron's books as well as links to his weekly podcast. Use his Amazon affiliate banner on the right-hand side of his blog site when doing your Amazon shopping. You don't pay more, and Aaron receives an affiliate payment of 6 to 7% from Amazon. Again, it doesn't cost you a penny more. Hey, the Safety Doc is placing a $300 order for some garage project materials, and that order will be placed through Aaron's Amazon affiliate link, which again is at captaincapitalism.blogspot.com. You just go over on the right-hand side. You see the Amazon logo. You click on it, and it takes you right to Amazon, just as you've seen Amazon a thousand times before. And you can go in and make your purchases or something, a little bit of code in the background that says, hey, you came from um, Aaron's site, captaincapitalism.blogspot.com, and then he does receive a payment of 6 to 7% of a commission, basically. Again, nothing additional for a fee for you. So um, please consider that. You know, we want to support our fellow podcasters and especially podcasters that are releasing uh, content on a regular basis and across different media, uh, mediums. So um, some more to share here today. I thought it printed front and back, and it didn't. Okay. Thank you to John Grant and the 405 Media for airing the Safety Doc podcast daily at 2 p.m. PST. Also, thanks to our show supporter, Sprigio, Sprigio.com, out of Santa Barbara, California, the nation's leader in bullying and threat input reporting software. Very prevalent in K-12 schools and expanding across the United States. Hey, if you're a parent and you're curious about what your school is doing for school reporting, ask the question and also say, hey, check out Sprigio, S-P-R-I-G-E-O, Sprigio.com out of Santa Barbara, California. ISS 24-7, ISS247.com, the leader in large venue um, management as, as far as incident management. Uh, several NFL uh, stadiums, NCAA arenas, malls, other large population-dense locations, ISS 24-7 app-based management. Nobody does it better than ISS 24-7. I've personally um, had uh, them on the show and uh, very familiar with it, with their products. So ISS 24-7, keeping you safe in large venues. Auphonics, hey, we have a new supporter here of the Safety Doc Show, Auphonics, A-U-P-H-O-N-I-C-S, Auphonics. Auphonics is um, a, a program, software company. They make software um, that greatly benefits podcasters and, and folks working in radio and that type of uh, medium. But um, what Auphonics, uh, I, I use a product, it is an, an Auphonics leveler, and um, I am able to upload my podcast into that. It works to level it out to what the standard then is for both radio and and um, 
YouTube, there there is actually a standard, and, and I didn't know that until uh, that was brought to my attention by another podcaster. It goes through all of that work. You don't have to do that on your own. It will it will bring it up to that that standard level. So you know when you're listening to the car and you go from one, you download ten po- podcasts, and every time a new podcast comes on, it's like whoa, I got to check the volume because you know that one's either like way soft or it's like super loud. So you know this gets you. Um, right where you should be with, with the volume of, of, of your podcast. And, th- and then it has so many algorithms uh, that work behind the scenes to, to just clean up the audio. Um, and it is, it is absolutely remarkable software, and it has the best user interface I have ever worked with. Um, it, you know, th- this might sound intimidating that, you know, to, to consider software like this. You actually take your file, you drag it over, your audio file, and you hit process, and that's it. It processes, goes through, gives you some very easy to interpret statistics on how it improved your audio file, and then it outputs it into a folder. Um, it actually puts a little tag on the end so you know, like it's it's not the original file; it's one that's, that has been improved through the Alphonics process, and it's right there, right for there for you to use. Just just awesome, and uh, and then you can import it back into any kind of processing editing you're doing, and you have this this terrific um, file. So again, Alphonics. You can go to Auphonics, A-U-P-H-O-N-I-C-S dot com and um, learn more about their software. They also have uh, mixing software. It, that's something I, I don't have because I don't need that. Um, but again, I use Auphonics leveling software. It is phenomenal. I mean, it, it, it's like magic. It's like taking your broadcast, putting it into a pot of magic, stirring it three times, bringing it out. And it's like, whoa, what happened? It's all golden and shiny and awesome now. So um, the, the, the quality, uh, and they just released an update. Um, to, the program already was outstanding, and then um, just in the last couple of weeks here, they released an update to further refine some of their algorithms and, and all those, those things that were kind of in the background. Um, again, off Onyx. So the Safety Podcast is on iTunes, it is on SoundCloud, and it's on YouTube. So um, all of those are free. And you can subscribe on iTunes to Safety Doc. We are up to uh, 32 podcasts right now. Again, uh, I release a weekly podcast. It is on SoundCloud, which makes it easier for those of you who, who want just a straight MP3 format. You can go into SoundCloud and get it. And then on YouTube, for those of you who like to watch the interviews, uh, well, I, about half the shows are interviews or just to watch me present, um, you can go into um, YouTube, the Safety Doc channel. Please consider following me on those different channels. Again, iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, um, and also Twitter at SafetyPhD. Twitter at SafetyPhD. In my little narratives um, that I link out for every video, I do a, a short blog post also that goes along, gets in a little more detail, might give out some links that were mentioned within the video. So um, I do encourage you, again, encourage you to do that. So I, the, it is the same exact um, podcast, you know, so the YouTube version is exactly the same as the I, iTunes audio. There's nothing that's going to be different between those. But some people do um, in, in prefer to watch on, on YouTube, and, you know, other people, you know, definitely appreciate the mobile nature of things. So I was recently interviewed by Kevin of the Wait What If podcast, Kevin of the Wait What If podcast. That was a terrific experience. He is um, uh, his background, just go to the waitwhatif.com website and read about his background, you know, serving our country in the military um, and then working, I believe, the last 15 years as a physici- physician's assistant. Um, that was, a, I really enjoyed that, that interview. Kevin, um, it was fun. It was dynamic. We covered a lot of uh, different, different uh, branches off of the topics that, that we had put together for the show. Um, so Kevin of the wait, what if podcast, and just do this, go to wait, what And, um, you can, I, you know, he has his archives, his, his previous podcast, very well developed. You know, he'll, he talks about, does a summary, talks about, um, the different guests. And then he also, you know, you can link out to his blog, link out to his other resources, but Ke- Kevin is insightful. I mean, he has an, he, because of his life experiences, he has, he has an insight. He, he's, he's wonderful to share these, these things forward and, and to very strategically identify, you know, guests to come on and, and just to help with that whole understanding of, of, um, you know, self and, and purpose and agency. Um, but, but through these, these very vibrant studies, um, um, 
and I mean interviews, you know, but but kind of studies into like you know the human mind and and, and how humans you know act and react in different uh, circumstances. So um, I enjoyed it. I can't wait till it's out. I know it's going to be a while because you know Kevin has uh, that's he has a popular show. So uh, I am I am on the on deck circle. You know, quite a few back. I mean, there's people swinging swinging the bats up in front of me. So. Um, but I think maybe sometime in July that'll be out. And I'll make sure that I, I post that. And I know Kevin will, will work on, you know, promoting that also. Uh, but again, thank you to Kevin of the, the wait, what if podcast, wait, what if.com. Um, so right now, Hey, enjoy this extended interview with the only motorcycling, fossil hunting, tornado chasing, book writing, ballroom dancing economist in the world, Aaron Clary. All right, today on the Safety Doc Podcast, I am welcoming Aaron Clary, economist, ballroom dancing instructor, (laughs) and so much more, but primarily a very well-established author. We will focus today on his book, Reconnaissance Man, and the relevance to that for young people in finding agency and purpose in their lives. Now, I want to preface this because when I mentioned that I would be doing this interview with Aaron back in my podcast 31, I said I worked with Aaron um, on Reconnaissance Man. What I meant to say is that I worked with Aaron to develop a set of questions so we could have a discussion about Reconnaissance Man. So um, not to to make it sound like um, I've, I've done the depth of work and I've had the travels and experiences that Aaron has had to, to put any of this together. Um, I've done a lot of work with agency and purpose, and in my also work with school districts, uh, work over the years with with uh, youth, agency and purpose, understanding um, what's out there in one's life is critical, and it is this massive void. It's this. It's only increasing. But um, I downloaded the book Reconnaissance Man. I do plan to download um, the Curse of the High IQ and Poor Richard's Retirement, which are additional books that Aaron has published. Poor Richard's Retirement is an essay. Uh, I found Reconnaissance Man to be extremely enlightening and listened to it several times. And so I'm going to talk about that today with Aaron. I do have some questions that I've asked him to elaborate, expand upon uh, from the book. And just for those of you listening, Reconnaissance Man by Aaron Clary is available on Amazon.com, I'm sure other sources. Uh, But what I'd like to do right now is welcome Aaron Clary to the show. And Aaron, if you could tell us about yourself. Hello. Um, Well, basically, I was originally a banker, uh, studied economics and finance, and did what all finance and economics majors do, go to banking. Uh, And it was horrendously boring, very, very boring. Until the housing market crisis, of which I predicted about a year before it actually happened. And I wrote a book about it before it actually happened. And uh, that kind of sent me down the odd trajectory of where I am today, where I'm predominantly an author, but with the expansion of social media, kind of like yourself and and other people, we kind of have like a a quasi-hobby profession career now in social media. So I have a podcast, a blog, and... um, and a, a consulting company, uh, but all that is the the engine of growth behind that is predominantly the books I've written. So, uh, with the housing market book, I then wrote several other books, uh, some of which you mentioned, all more or less loosely themed around economics or kindly economic bubbles or philosophy. So, like education bubble, retirement bubble, uh, and then more philosophical ones like uh, reconnaissance man and bachelor pad economics and and that's what I do today. So this is this is my real job. This is my real office, uh, unless I'm gallivanting about on a motorcycle, in which case my office is either a buddy's couch or a Motel Eight somewhere in Yuma, Arizona. One of the books, Aaron, um, that you had written a while ago, uh, I believe, was worthless. Mm-hmm. And and you indicated that June is is worthless degree. Awareness. Yes, it is. Yes, it is worthless but, degree. Awareness. Yes, it is. Yes. And and I want to um, I, I want to just give a, a quick personal account on that. When I went to the University of Wisconsin Madison to pick up my uh, doctoral degree, my my dissertation, my PhD, uh, the reason I chose Madison and the reason that I took on. Um, 
a, a dissertation where I would be spending two years studying um, high stakes decision making in the military, healthcare, and education. But you know, going into military combat from even when you know Lincoln was telling General Meade, "Hey, pursue Lee," and Meade's like, "Hey, forget it. Like, there's no way. I'm not doing it." You know, and um, but I went and I broke down data sets and, and just went into different models and contacted different experts and just fully immersed. And people would ask, like, why are you doing that? And I said, the reason I'm doing this is because when I get done with this, I'm going to be an expert in an area that no one else is an expert in. And I've been able to flip that into not only some book contracts, but then also expert witness work that I do around the country. And, you know, people will ask a little bit about that. And that's hit and miss. But, you know, expert witness work pays very well. And and there's so many doors that have opened because of the challenges of the late nights of putting this together and working with different people and of challenging yourself. And there were so many opportunities to go to other programs or, or pick up a lesser degree and just get the credentials. And I said, there's no way I'm going to do that. I'm going to challenge myself. Um, so when I come out, I have something that nobody else has, that I have this very high level technical expertise where I can talk about applied decision making analysis models and things like that but anyway so i mean i'm 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 very much with you on that of of the path of what you choose for a degree and what young people choose for a degree is absolutely critical because the moment you realize hey i just got my bachelor's degree and you throw your hat up in the air and it lands and you're like oh by the way i have you know 30 to 50 thousand dollars <laughs> in debt and i'm going to be starting out at if i get a job you know 20 to thirty thousand dollars a year and and whatever economic climate you know it just doesn't make sense um so i appreciate that that you did bring that up because i have i've personally you know brought that up and i've i've had that discussion with others um even in my field where if you start to stratify the phds and you know the ed doctorates and things like that um, you know, I said, I can go anywhere I want and teach. I can, you know, be an expert witness in 50 states. And it's because I did the hard route. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I appreciate, I appreciate worthless. I don't think it applies anymore to me. I'm done with school, buddy. So Well, we're old too. That's the <laughs> other thing. I mean, we're old. It, it, it may have had a little bit of application right. when Robin Yount worked for the Brewers. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, today it really it really has more application to right. to kids attending college today. Us old farts, yeah, right? it doesn't matter. It's yeah, and Aaron, you know what? I signed. I went to a Brewers game and I came home and I signed my baseball glove with Robin Yacht signature and showed it to my friends to impress. Oh, them. did you? <laughs> and somebody stole it. Somebody no. stole it. I had they it. They stole it. Oh, so I'd... like it was gone. Oh man. <laughs> So you yeah, falsified I, I Robin Yelp mint. It's all gone somewhere out there. And someone's selling it for, on eBay for yeah. 3000 bucks right now. I've been validated, you know, and everything is behind plexiglass right now. And it's like, no, it's, it was a signature of a 10 year old kid. So um, <laughs> I'm going to talk about, about agency and, and purpose because I had a colleague who completed a study recently. Um, and, and, and in this study, and my colleague is a very thorough researcher. She worked with high school students, a, a very large cross-section of high school students. Um, and these were your, your typical high school students. You know, they, they, they did the work. Um, they participated well in, in the research questions and her research, you know, framework that she had. So, um, but one of the things is not one, not one Aaron, not one could identify a goal for either career or for life. So, you know, I went back and I met with with my colleague who did the research and she's like, nope, no one ever talked. I'm just going to cross some things off here in the notes, but no one ever talked about affinity process, you know, where you just come up with all these ideas and throw them up on the wall and post it notes and try to figure out, you know, hey, I, I'd like to do this. Like I'm interested in medical or or something like that. Or, you know what, I've, I've loved computer programs since I've been been young um and and i've got some interest i mean nothing nothing like that or you, um and then also establishing you know the constructs of just kind of figuring out well these things kind of focus more on like where you live like you you mentioned a lot about you know you want to be outside and, and you like hiking and stuff and um you know I the sun just, don't forget the sun oh the sun I, like I, the sun yeah and we both you know aaron and i both grew up in wisconsin and and i'm telling you you know once that that final time you have to turn the clock back in November, it's like, oh no, 
No, I don't want it dark at four twelve in the afternoon. You, no. you have fun with that's when I go down to Arizona <laughs> and I let you hold the fort down. Because I don't I don't do winter anymore. <laughs> you wouldn't believe the lights I've got down here. You know, just just to try to to get a little bit of vitamin D. You know, out of the very minimal exposed fingertips. Um, so so yeah, this so kids. When I say kids, I'm talking you know high school high school age kids. They don't know the affinity process. They don't know how to establish constructs. Uh, they don't know how to develop a timeline. They can't identify needed resources. They don't know how to establish a, a baseline, just where am I at. They, they can't determine how they're going to measure a change from baseline. And then also how to monitor progress and recalibrate. I mean, it's fine to say, hey, you know what? I thought this is what I wanted to do, and it's not what I want to do, so I'm going to change it. But none of that, none of that's going on. And I'm thinking to myself, um, these are the kids that right now I want to, I, you know, I want to find these kids and say, here's the audible version of reconnaissance, man, mm -hmm. listen to it and then listen to it again. And then listen to it again. And let's sit down and talk. Mm -hmm. So tell me what your, your, your thoughts are, you know, just in me sharing that. And I'm sure that's nothing new, you know, for, for you, but how does reconnaissance man come in and, and help kids that I've, I've just described to you. Well, it, it gives them a roadmap, a how-to manual. Uh, and it doesn't surprise me at all that, that your colleague found out that these kids have no planning ability whatsoever because neither parents nor the schools actually teach these kids about life, about life planning, uh, about goal setting or anything. Like, it, it, school, for the most part, uh, is horrendously boring. Uh, we, we, we don't teach kids philosophy, like the meaning of life or anything. It's like, Hey, here's this test. Now we're going to teach you how to take this test for the next six months. And, uh, then we're going to put you in another class and we're going to, there's this other new test now and we're going to, and so, and you see it. I mean, if you got kids, you know, and maybe you yourself remember high school and I mean, you fell asleep because unfortunately the sad truth is we don't really put kids in school to educate them. We, we predominantly, I'd say, put them there. So parents don't have to deal with them during the daytime. And then the state and academians and, and bureaucrats come in and say, well, we like this. We think that, but there is no longitudinal look forward about, okay, are we teaching these kids to be independent minded? Are we preparing for the real world or are we merely teaching them to take tests because that's what the state says. That's what the law says. They have to go to school and some, uh, some people who have triple doctorates in education, but never worked a day in the real world or laid sod. They're going to tell people what they think through meta-analysis studies. And meanwhile, the kids are falling asleep. So it's not a shock to me at all because uh, we were there. I already remember. I mean, oh, right. I, uh, yeah, I mean, I had, I, through the grace of God, I got a 3.0 <laughs> higher. My mom was like, you better get more. And like, because I had like a 2.3 doing your homework on the bus. Right. You know. And, and these kids nowadays, they think they were the originator of like your with you are and this this abbreviated text thing. No, we came up with that when I'm writing full book reports because that's how much I hated school. And so there's no, it's no shot. There's no, and then the parents, I'm not to slam on teachers, but parents don't. Parents are so busy with mortgages and debts and car loans and their own student loans. They're not raising these kids because they themselves a lot of times don't know the answers to life. They don't, they, they're like, they're just staying afloat. And then you're throwing after school activities, you're running your kids around, you're shoving food in their faces. Sometimes they eh, get in the car, we got to go. There's no sitting down and taking the time to inventory. What are we doing? Not only with our own lives, but with our own children's lives. Uh, and so that what kids are taught is they're taught how to go to school. That's what kids are taught. So that when you take an 18 year old, uh, of today contrast with say an 18 year old of the world war ii generation well the 18 year old of the world war ii generation who was male pretty much like hey we got a great fun place called germany to take you to yes. uh but there was a, a factory there was your dad's shop there was something and you were taught trades and skills or something like you got to go and where you got to work on the farm women same thing except perhaps more traditional you know sewing or seamstress or secretarial work or what have you uh, but there was some kind of career at the end of that. Maybe you went to vocation and very few, but if you were there, you, you went to, on to college. Uh, but it was, you were, you were trained more for becoming an adult earlier on. Now it's okay. We got to take tests. And if anything, we prepare people, you know, there's college preparatory schools. Okay. Now you yes. go and do high school version 2.0, but even in college, the answer of what do I really want to do in life 
is never asked or answered. And so that's what this book does. It, it, it is, was originally written for kids who were in high school or maybe finishing the first year in, in college or whatever. And they either didn't know what they wanted to study in college or they didn't even know if they wanted to continue going to college. Uh, but then the lessons therein are written. It, it obviously would be beneficial to high school and college age uh, uh, people. Uh, but it's also for anyone where you quit your job, you're off a divorce, or you plain don't know what you want to do in life. Uh, that's because I don't think anyone really takes the time to sit down, evaluate their lives, and then do strategic planning with it, asking themselves, where do I want to go? Where do I want to be? It's nope, it's the next test, it's the next promotion, it's the next whatever life is putting in front of you. And there's never, you're never put at the helm of your own life. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Aaron, tell us more about the the book itself, you know, um, what it covers, what what the purpose is, um, just a description of the book. Well, the the basically it's a methodological, like a, a I wouldn't say decision no tree, but a, a logical theorem. There's an organized methodology to figuring out where you want to live, who you are, and what you want to do. And the key philosophy or my opinion, because this hasn't been proven or anything like that, it's just been my personal experience and observations. The key philosophy that's based on is that if you can find out where you want to live, that's going to help you answer a lot of other things. And not just finding, aha, I want to live in Walla Walla, Washington. Also, the process and journey by which you take to figure out where you belong in this world is also going to answer a lot of questions about who you are, what you want to become, et cetera. So what I recommend, and it, it depends on how you digest it or amortize uh, your, quote, reconnaissance or, or reconnoitering the country, but it, it takes at least a year of going out, and it's a big country, uh, going out, traveling around, spending adequate time in cities and areas of the country that you think you'd like, whittling it down, and then finally saying, aha, I belong in Denver, Colorado because of these reasons. And then from there, you go on like, okay, now maybe I'll go to the, uh, uh, the what's it called, Colorado School of Mines and become yes. a geologist. Or maybe I'll go to the University of Boulder and I'll become an actuary. Uh, but your environment, where you are, is what I at least uh, I contend determines the plurality of your happiness. Whether uh, you and I would probably be much happier in Florida come wintertime, I'm pretty sure. Um People like uh, people and hobbies that you like to do, uh, activities, uh, also what kind of lifestyle do you want rural, do you want city, do you want suburban, oh, and, and uh, literally a limitless number of variables that go into where you are. One, one thing I like to use as an example is you can find the greatest town ever, but you find out you're horrendously allergic to the local pollen coming from whatever trees. Right. So it, it, it behooves every person to go out and explore this country and, and go find a different place. And OK, fine. Maybe you figure out you want to go back and live in Menominee Falls, Wisconsin, which all my friends did. Uh, <laughs> but but that's because they never left. They right. never knew they never they never they never did any reconnaissance. And so that's that's kind of the general philosophy of the book is go explore before you plant roots anywhere, before you get any liabilities, kids, school, debts. Just go work some job, any job, take it, get gas money and go explore and figure out first where you want to be. And then if you go there, plant your roots, develop networks, uh, you're going to at least be growing in an environment that you like, which is going to be much more rewarding in the long run for your life. So, Aaron, I grew up uh, more central northern Wisconsin. Uh, for those of you, anyone in looking at a map was near Wassa. You know where that is, but um, I do. anyway, <laughs> you know. So I remember the winters, and and my birthday is November seventh, and I remember winters when, you know, there would already be six feet of snow, and driving out or having my parents, you know, drive me out before I had a license to a friend's house, and the snow banks would be as high as the telephone wires, and I'd be mm -hmm. like, this sucks because. I hate this. I am not a winter person. I am not a snowmobile person. I'm not a skier. You know, I'm into none of this. You know, so we, so we, and going outside, you know, having basketball practice in the gym, then, you know, 
Well, coach would be like, hey, get in a little practice. So you, you take the ball, which would stay warm for about 45 seconds until you get it outside. And it, it, you know, then it, it got down to the 22 degrees or whatever. And, you know, you're trying to bounce it off with gloves. Just flat. <laughs> get a little bit of practice and stuff like that. And I'm like, yeah, that's, I'm like, oh, man. And, and, and yet, you know, we moved a little bit southern and it was south in Wisconsin. So granted, there is a differential of like we have two more weeks of better weather, I guess. But mm-hmm. if in thinking, you know, as I'm listening to reconnaissance, man, I'm thinking I should have gotten out of here. I should have gotten down to, yeah, you know, in, into Colorado, into Wyoming, Phoenix, into any place. Yeah. And, and yeah. I didn't. I mean, no. And it's such a regret for me now because yeah we do have established roots i mean my kids go to school the schools are you know a few blocks away um and and granted not to to um you know dismiss you know the the community i live in but i'm like you know i love to bike like i'll bike 70 80 miles and it doesn't matter if it's 90 degrees out. i love it so of course i can do that three months of the year and then the then it's done and, and the rest gone, of the yeah. time, I'm looking like outside of like snow melt, snow melt, melt. <laughs> get you know, give me my three months where I can be alive, and then I can go back into some mental hibernation. Um, and it's sad. And and uh, I I shared with you, you know, we did our first trip to Disney World, Orlando, um, right. this this March. So I'm 45. First time. So it was first time through Tennessee, Kentucky, Alabama. Um, Florida, I don't know, there's probably another state in there somewhere, but, um, anyway, and we drove it and I wanted to drive it because I wanted to see some of these areas. I, the, the battle of Paducah, I had researched a little bit in civil war. Now there wasn't much I got to see there, but at least like I had, I got to see what was around in a little bit of reconnaissance. And it was just sparking this in me of, you know, I'm not sure, you know, down the road, as as we're going through places and I can start to roll the window down and it's not like the snow falls <laughs> in on you. And it's like, uh, you know, well, not rolling down on a vehicle like that anymore. But um, but I'm like, you know, I could imagine actually living here. Like if I had my bike, I could be out biking today. You know, we would go oh, yeah. to Paducah versus, you know, leaving with the winter coat on. Um, and not that Paducah would be the place to settle. But I mean, just, to, just that awareness. And um, you know, we're down in Florida and of course, you know, it's, it's the mid eighties and things like that. And, and, but, um, it, it was this awareness and it was about the same time, you know, I'm processing through reconnaissance, man, of, of saying to myself, if I could go back to my, my 18 year old self, or oh. my 20 year old self, I'd be like, Hey, <laughs> Hey, here's the deal. Slap them, shake them. <laughs> You, you are going out there, buddy, and, and don't worry about this. Like, this will work out for you. And and, the, and I do have a question for you, but I, something I think that's come into this, and I talked to Dr. Uh, Paul Rapp, who's the head of uh, military medicine, actually yesterday. Um, it, it was ironic. I, I gave him a call, and uh, I was an hour late because apparently – you know, I can I can understand a lot of these theories and stuff, but I don't understand how to convert time zones. Uh, and it's not the first time I've done that, which was incredibly embarrassing. But, um, uh, but you know, anyway, you know, I'm I'm thinking about some of these things as I'm going through him of you know, like even um, professor positions that aren't in the Midwest, you know, to open mm-hmm. up and, and exploring out into you know, like uh, into Colorado. And into you know some of those areas, and, and then also what that would mean, like as far as I know, I'm happier when it's sunnier out. I know I'm happier when I can oh, yeah. bike and and yeah. like and even you know get outside. I'm just happier. So so the question, like I have, I listen to your podcast. I I enjoy your podcast. I think um, because I've had the benefit to listen to the aggregate of your podcast, it really builds um, the messages that that you deliver. Mm-hmm. Um, how in the world, Aaron, did you go from Wisconsin to Minnesota? And, uh, and, and how did that happen versus going from Wisconsin to, to you know, like a it, Denver? It's the same. Re- <laughs> it's because it's I wanted to get away from my folks. Okay. And Minnesota had reciprocity back then. And then my, also my grandpa and my grandma and my aunt lived in Minneapolis. And well, my grandpa was out in Morris, Minnesota. Uh, and they were the most wonderful people in my life. And it was not even... A thought 
it was just, it's a given. I'm going to the University of Minnesota because it's the only place I can afford. I love it out there. And I have people I love out there. Well, th- to a 17, 16, heck, I even, I was 14 when I figured it out. I even, when I was 14, saw the job I wanted when I visited the U of M campus and saw a campus cop bike by on his bike. Um, so I, it was destined that that was going to happen. But no one told me, hey, as you get older, snow days don't happen. Like, you know, you don't get to go and sled all the time. And hey, in Minnesota, it drops to minus 25 degrees, you know, at least once a winter. And oh, the reason you had so much fun is because it was summer when we were visiting your grandpa and you're not going to get to visit your grandpa all the time. You're going to have to work. And so I went to a state that was colder, more snow, less sun, simply because I didn't have the wisdom or at least parental guidance or anyone telling me, hey, look, I know you're worried about affording college, but here's an idea. Why don't you go to Denver, since all we do is look at pictures of mountains, go to Denver, work there for a while, get residency, and then you can attend in-state. And so what? You might graduate when you're 23, but I also didn't have any wise counsel telling me, don't worry, your jobs are all going to be lousy until you're 30. So whether you graduate at 22 or 23, it doesn't matter. Go to Denver. Go to Moab, if you like biking, check out Moab, Utah. There's no university there. Go to Salt Lake City. Go to Rapid City. Go to Phoenix. Go any place, but don't go to Minnesota. But there's that's how I ended up in Minnesota. It, it's because of your environment and your context and how you make decisions. Well, the information I had was very limited, and there was no other information that was going to be added to that system. And so the logical conclusion anybody would have made is, let's go to Minnesota. Yeah. And one of the things I think plays into that, and it's become more and more part of my research, is this concept called transference, or basically meaning um, what other people tell us, like our parents, for example, or someone we might look up to, uh, we kind of follow their their lead. So you had you had relatives that, that um, you respect it, and they were in Minnesota. So, um, you know, there wasn't much questioning that you kind of went along with that line. Right. Um, and, and for me, you know, one of the things for transference, for example, was I didn't buy my first vehicle with a sunroof until I was like almost 40. And the reason, <laughs> Aaron, the reason was because my mom kept saying, you know, it, you know, my mom kept saying, vehicles with sunroofs, they always leak. They always leak. Never buy a vehicle with a sunroof. <laughs> I'm like, so, you know, I'm 16 years old. I buy my first vehicle, which is a Plymouth Duster off of my grandpa. Um, you know, which was actually pretty cool to do that. You know, grandpa's selling you his hot rod, but, um, uh, which actually needed didn't a have a sunroof though. It did not have a sunroof. It was sun a lot roof. more work too than what grandpa ever kind of let on <laughs> on that. But anyway, um, but yeah, it didn't have a sunroof. So I finally, I'm buying this, this vehicle, a sunroof, and I'm just sitting there with fingers crossed of like, okay, this thing's going to leak. This is, and of course it's fine. It doesn't leak once, never, not a drop of water, not like just a hint of mist coming through this thing. And I'm like, I never, I, I, I just was so focused on transference of just, you know, this is what I was told. So I just followed it and I never questioned it. And I go to this image in my mind of, <laughs> okay, you know, how graduation day obviously is in high school. Well, you know, that, that after graduation, you know, all of the all of the the females graduating, they kind of go off in their own area. All the men have, or all the the young men have to stay, and then all of a sudden, the 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 men of the town, you know, the townsfolk yeah. men, filter in and they sit in the bleachers and then they lock the doors and they're like, and they come up, you know, kind of one by one as a spokesperson saying, "Guys, this is what it's really like. Like you've got to get out there before you know, mm-hmm. you know, you you get locked into this path of having your." you know, parents kind of dictate, tell you what to do. Or, mm-hmm. you know, if you, if you, if you think you're going to get married at 18, it's like, put that out the window, you know. And you this is in know. Wisconsin? Yeah. Well, you never had this. No, this no, is... I'm thinking about this, but. Oh, you're is... thinking about this would be a good, okay. Yeah. Yeah. This, this, this is what I think should happen. You know, it's, it's like you have this and it's, you know, the, the, the guys have gone through it and say, don't make the same mistakes we made. Get out, get out, get out, go down to Texas, go down to, to Dallas for a while or, you know, do this or, you know, go out to the, to the oil fields or do whatever, like, right. like get out guys, you know, and, uh, and that, but, uh, so yeah, you know, I, 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 it's such a ridiculous story with that sunroof, but yet, you know, it was one of these things where 
I think that transference happens. And, that, and that's the part we got to break with kids of saying, you know, when you're 18, you got to break away. You got to break away uh-huh. and you got to go out and you got to do reconnaissance, as you indicated, you know, in your in your book. And I'll I'll kind of break it down and you can elaborate if you want. But for, for people listening, in Aaron's book, there are, I found three, um, three main constructs. And the first is the rationale for reconnaissance. The second is the mechanical or technical considerations for reconnaissance. Um, you indicated things too, like, you know, if you have to sleep in your car, here's how to do it. Here's how you can take some mosquito netting and duct tape. Still do. Them. Still do so, to yeah. this day, yes. And I like that you did that because, you know, by doing that, you immediately take away that barrier for someone thinking, ah, oh, I can't do reconnaissance because I can't afford it. And you're like, no, no, dude, you can afford it. You can totally, totally can. afford it. Yep. There's a way. There's multiple ways. And then you went down and you broke the analysis of, of states and, and regions. Oh, yeah. um, and, and, you know, if you have a map in front of you uh, it, it, and kind of look at that, you know, it makes a lot of sense. And here's where you can kind of center yourself and then kind of explore out from there. So, um, and today we're talking more about, again, that, that why for a kind of sense. So uh, you, you had mentioned, Aaron, I thought this was, was interesting because someone said the same thing to me, that when you're, when you're doing a reconnaissance, not that I've done a lot of reconnaissance because I really, I really have, but I've done, you know, some, but, um, drive with the radio turned off and, and, and take in what's, what's happening around you, I guess, be able to process your thoughts. Um, and I guess, can you tell me, I mean, was that something you came upon or was that something that someone told you and said, you know, when you're driving air and turn off, you know, don't keep seeking out the radio station. No, no, there, there was, I, I'm the oldest, I'm the oldest in the family. There was no, everything, I hate to sound so arrogant. I figured out everything <laughs> from scratch. Okay. And let me tell you, it's not fun. You, you, I would have killed to have an older brother say, okay, let me save you a decade of your life. But no, I figured that out, um, through working security in college. And this gets back to the, um, to strategizing. So, uh, I work at night, work in security and a lot of the shifts we could get, you could work on your own, on your homework, but then a lot of them were patrols. And what would happen in, inevitably is during Christmas break and summer break, um, uh, students would be away or there'd be very few students. And a lot of our job was to escort girls back and forth from classes, parking lots, stuff like that. So then you get a lot of time to yourself. Well, if it's winter break or Christmas or summer break and you don't have any homework, you got nothing else to do but sit and think. And so whether I was out patrolling or whether I was sitting at a desk, a, a desk detail, I would start to strategize and plot and figure some things out. And I was predominantly classes to take, how to get a college, you know, career, financial projections. But I always had a very good grasp of my life, where it was going, and more or less controlled for all the variables that were under my control. Uh, but a key to that is you need to sit down and take time. One of the, the most common problems I have with my clients today is they come to me and say, what should I study? I'm like, how do I know what you should study? I mean, right, I know what right. you shouldn't study, right. but have you thought and asked yourself what you like? I mean, that's the first place to start. And then you you whittle it down through a process and a filter. And so I've had kids come up, well, I'm thinking about engineering. I'm thinking about going to the military. And I'm like, whoa, I can't, you know, I could tell you to be in the ballpark and not major in English in an English speaking country. I could tell you not to major in women's studies. I can tell you not to major in puppetry, which is an actual degree you can get. I can't tell you the difference between going and joining ROTC and becoming an officer or becoming an electrical e- engineer or going, going to programming boot camp. Um, that's up to you. But this gets back to kind of the original point of reconnaissance, man, is you need to figure out what you want to do in life. Nobody does that from basically kindergarten on your life is scheduled out and then if you have kids it's really scheduled out so take the time to sit and figure things out where you want to go and so more recently when i've been doing most of my reconnaissance in the united states it was in my 30s um it, it wasn't so much where do i want to go what do i want to be it was like okay i've listened to enough podcasts i've listened to enough audiobooks uh or i would just run out because i do a lot of hiking so I, I just have nothing new to listen to and uh, and you know this driving in Wisconsin in the 80s where you got out of the city and all you had was Jesus stations and country stations. Yes. You're like, I'm not listening <laughs> yet. So silence is better. And what ended up happening is not only would I figure out more things about where I'd like to go strategically, but since that was predominantly figured out before, I came up with business ideas. So three, one of uh, the best, one of which is my best business idea, my most profitable one, I came up with driving across the plain states late at night. 
and I always carry a, a notepad when I'm driving and I just take notes uh, because your mind will wander and it will naturally figure out what is necessary and what's of uttermost important on its own. You just let the mind go and you will start thinking about things. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, that's a really great idea. And then you write that down. Oh, I hadn't thought about that. Or you'll think about some plan you have or some route you're going down and then you'll realize there's a problem or a flaw with that plan you hadn't thought of before. And then you'll re but it's this, it, nobody does it. Nobody does that and sits down and s thinks things through. So everyone is basically spinning their wheels or chasing after going down a, a path that's not necessarily going to lead to ruin, but it certainly will waste time. So that's how I kind of got to turning the radio off, either because I wasn't listening to anything new and pot and I had, but also it's like, no, I got to take inventory, reevaluate, reassess, see how things are going. Am I on track? Am I on target? Oh, yeah, I am. And then all of a sudden your mind will also start to explore and wander and come up with great new ideas. And so that's that's why, I stress, especially younger. Now I'm old, you're old, we, we, we kind of know a little bit more than an 18 year old kid. But if you're an 18, 19 year old kid and you don't know what you want to do with life, turn off Taylor Swift. Yes. Turn off Froofy Fru and her tripperoos. Turn off that garbage and just sit and think for the next week you're out driving around the West. And you're going to come back with, you may not have all the answers, but you're going to come back infinitely more informed and infinitely more knowledgeable about yourself and what you want to do than if you just listened to podcasts or chit chatted with your BFF in the passenger seat. So you, you were talking about writing things down. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming you're not doing this while you're driving. Or oh, yeah. Yeah. You, you kids, don't text. <laughs> right. Don't write. Don't take notes. Always pull over and do what everybody says you should do. Say, But me personally, no. I just keep on Because here's the other thing. All right. Unless I'm in the mountains and I'm curving around. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm 10 and 4. Uh, but you ever drive across Nebraska? You know, I did. You did? I okay. Did. What are you like going to hit? You're not going to hit anything. A month ago, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just. Uh, so I, you know, I pull it up. Like, I, you can drive with a knee and yeah. do that. But well, kids, no, don't do that. It's very dangerous. The it's, only reason I said that, Aaron, was um, I have, and for those of you who watch this on YouTube, which is virtually nobody, but uh, mostly in audio, I, oh, I have yeah, a, yeah. an yeah. audio recorder. This thing's like 40 bucks, and it records. Um, so you put batteries in it, and literally it'll record for like, you know, 50 hours, and it's all digital. So, and then you just plug it in, and, and, it, and it over, you know, you can download it as an MP3. Mm. But I go out at night, and I will run with this thing because, you know, like with my book contracts, I'll actually run. And when I come up with thoughts and it was the craziest, I mean, this is going to sound a little geekish, but I'm out running the other night and, uh, and I come up, I didn't have this thing with me and, and I come up with this, this formula that I'm trying to do for this, this nonlinear regression formula. Um, it sounds more complicated than, than what it is, but it's part of, part of this book that I, that I'm publishing. And I'm like, I'm never going to remember this. By the time I get home, this will be gone. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have this. But otherwise, like, I'll just, I'll just like bring this out and I'll just, you know, I'll give my thoughts. Um, and I do this too, more and more, you know, if I'm going on, on treks, you know, just by myself or if I, if I'm out on my bike, you know, I'm doing like 80 miles, mm -hmm. you know, I'll just, I'll just pull it out. And, uh, you know, as I'm, as I'm biking, you know, I'll just like come up with, with things that I'm, that I'm thinking kind of my own member check. Um, mm. and I, and I do have some people now, actually, I can, I can trust as member checks that I've actually gone to. And I said, Hey, listen, like, and I did this, I mean, am, am I like being a, a, you know, kind of like a jerk in some of this stuff or whatever? And I'd be like, yeah, like totally dude, you are like, <laughs> what? To tell you this. like, yeah, you're, you know, like the emails you're sending and just things like it's, you know, you're really unhappy. Um, you know, and one of the things too is, you know, um, back, you know, you mentioned this. And your references to things like, you know, swingy stick and stuff like that. And, and, yeah, swingy uh, stick. I, I think you evolve, and this is where you know, I want to get the curse of the high Q. In the 90s, I attended every home Packers game, including the playoffs. Every home Packers game. And right now, I mean, I don't, I really don't listen to the Packers on Sunday. And it's like, how can you do that? I mean, not that I'm not a Packers fan, but I don't live and die by the team. And I, and I own like maybe one shirt that's still left over. Uh -huh. And the logo is half falling off because it's been washed that many times. And, you know, eventually it's just going to be a green shirt. But um, 
but you know, people will be like, well, what do you think about this? Or what you, or did you hear about this? You know, they tore the Achilles. I'm like, I don't, I don't watch that. I, I mean, I don't watch the news. I you don't, don't get your fantasy football up. You, you I don't do have, have a fan. I, I, oh, I, I'm wow. In one, I'm in one league. <laughs> like, I've been in for like 20 years. Is there at the least money? Guys. Is there money involved in it at least? Yeah. Yeah, there is. Okay. Then, all right. Then there's at least something to cheer for. All right. Okay. So, no. yeah. And I, I won it like uh, two years ago. I set the league record like 15 oh. and three and I finished last the two the two past seasons so it kind of uh it kind of knows that so yeah you know for recreation just the, just the guys but um but yeah i'm not tied into this external this external thing you know and people saying um you know like hey i gotta go to like summer fest or like i gotta do this or i gotta yeah. do that i'm like well i'm like those things are nice to partake in and have some experiences but like this is your whole life you know like Come on. I mean, there's so much more out there to experience. Um, but that's that's the majority of people. That's I still I mean, it's sad. I because I ride I, I ride back down to Milwaukee occasionally and I'm surprised, with, especially with Facebook, just how many people, not friends, mind you, just people I knew because I, I wasn't quite popular. There are people that still live within a two mile radius of my <laughs> high school. I'm like, you literally never right. went like I could see the high school <laughs> from your house. You never left. There's, I mean, Chicago, come on, at least try Chicago. It's an hour and a half south. Go there. Check it out. Nope, everyone. And you're right. Summerfest, Brewers, Packers, Sunday. People are aware. I, well, you know this. Maybe many people who aren't familiar with Wisconsin culture don't know this. You can wear perfectly culturally acceptable to wear Packers garb to weddings and funerals. <laughs> yes. It's perfectly acceptable. Um, but you are absolutely right. Yeah, this is – these people, you know, uh, my goal, especially with reconnaissance, man, would be to get people to realize there's more important stuff than cheering on some guy throwing an oblong ball to get it past the line. Right. Uh, that that there is you and that you have nothing to do with the Green Bay Pack. Nothing wrong going and cheering them on. Absolutely sure. I remember when they actually won Super Bowls and the Vikings never have yet. I, I can see, okay, have a little bit of fun. But when you live and breathe and die that, because that's all you have for purpose and agency in the world, well, you have no real reason to be living. It's sad. You're living vicariously through other men and, and, and women or cheerleaders. Uh, so you got to get out. Uh, those people, above all else, need to be reconnaissance, man. Those people need it the most. So, so Aaron, you talked about taking notes, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you're out on your, your, your travels, what are you recording? Are you, are you recording? Um, this is how I feel. This is, this is a place I'd like to come back to. I mean, what are you actually writing down? Or is it even like your own thoughts of like, Hey, it feels. <laughs> it's, it's, I, I, it's more for me personally, it's entrepreneurial ideas and strategy. Okay. For someone who would be younger and try to figure out, you should be writing down notes that of anything pertinent to you. Because keep in mind, reconnaissance, okay, you want to find out where you want to live, but you also want to figure out who you are and what you want to do. And so for uh, an 18-year-old's notes or a 19-year-old's notes are going to have a, a much wider array of topics on it than what mine would be. I'm, I wouldn't, I'm not journaling. That's not what I'm, for me, but I'm much more narrow and focused. I have my game plan. I know what I want to do. Yes. My goal is to never answer to a boss again. And so I survive with ideas and entrepreneurial ideas. That, so anything I come up with, that's what I, what I, what I come up with and I write down. Uh, but for practitioners of reconnaissance, first-time reconnaissance type of folk, it's, it's basically life planning. Or, or anything. So, and you'll remember, like if you'll remember which towns you liked and which ones you didn't, uh, because the more memorable ones, you'll be like, holy cow. Whereas you're not going to remember Edgemont, South Dakota. Nobody will. Uh, cause it's just, there's nothing there. Yes. Uh, so you'll, you'll all say, Oh wow. I remember I had a great time in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. I couldn't believe Lake Coeur d'Alene. I have the mountains and the silver mining. I just love that. I might like to go back there sometime. So I don't, I don't really take necessarily notes on, you'll remember places you really did like, uh, but it would be more for like, okay, what type of major should I think of? What type of career? Um, maybe I should do some research down the road as to the cost of children. What do they cost? Do I really want to buy a house? Maybe I should do some rent buy analysis based on, how, so that everything that's involved in life and life planning that you should be doing, but you don't have time to do during the daytime because you're commuting, sitting at a job, commuting yes. back, doing that's the stuff you should be writing down. So, so the you know what, what I see right now is so we have a, an eighteen year old listening to this, 
Okay. And they go off and they do reconnaissance. Here's mm -hmm. what I think they're going to do. They're going to go off and do reconnaissance and they're going to take their phone and they are going to be snapping, you know, 500 pictures a day, posting them up on, um, you know, Instagram and whatever. And they're going to be, be narrating this or maybe blog posts and stuff. And it's like, you're not really in the moment. All you're doing <laughs> is you're, you're just, you're, you're just going out and, and, you know, doing a journal of, of what you're observing. It's all first order. You're just being mm -hmm. very linear. And here's like, I went through in this and you, and you never cut loose. I mean, you, you're, you're checking at every possible buzz. I mean, you're pulling, okay, here's my Facebook update. Here's what this was. And it's mm -hmm. like, you got to break free of that. Like you've got to break free of that. If you really want to immerse yourself, you can't have this artificial bubble of, of social media reality that, that you're living in and you're just kind of hopping from place to place and then just posting your updates. So I guess, how do you, that's, that's my biggest thing is, you know, I'll, I know, you know, some, you know, some 18 year olds in that and I'll be like, dude, put the phone <laughs> down. I'm like, you know, you just, it, it just buzzed. I got to check what happened. It's like, you know, no, it's like, so how, I think I think you're over worried about that. Look, if okay. you get an 18 year old kid to go do reconnaissance, that's a miracle unto itself. At least the kid is getting out there. All right. So I'd say 90 percent of it is done. Uh, the other thing is that and there's so many things that are going to be naturally working for what you would like to have. And that is immersing. So, you know, going again to, to Nebraska or Wyoming or Montana, especially if you go out west, there's lots of places where I don't care if you have a cell phone. There's no cell phone reception. You know, you go <laughs> hiking in Moab, Utah, you're not going to have cell phone reception. So a lot of these kids, especially in unpopulated areas, are going to be forced to be in the moment. A second thing is, uh, you know, perfect is the enemy of good. Just be happy these kids are out there yeah. going around and exploring. That's because you and I didn't. We didn't. They're already one up above us, and you're worried about whether they're checking in with their girlfriend or not. And I'm like, ah, you know what? If they've never seen mountains, don't worry. Uh, their girlfriend could send them a picture later. They'll look at the mountains. They'll look at the streams because they've never seen that before. Um, so there's going to be natural beauty, the novelty of never seeing things again. And the other thing is you get into a town you're not familiar with, especially if you're younger, you don't have a lot of driving experience. You don't have time to be looking at your phone driving in Denver. You don't have time to be, you know, chatting while you're driving through Los Angeles. They will be completely attentive. And I'm not necessarily the, the vanity or the bragging that comes with posting pictures like, aha, look at me, I'm on my Florida boat. I think that's actually good. Uh, one, because it's going to entice other young people. Oh, look at what Bobby's doing. Bob, man, Dad, Bobby gets to go do a reconnaissance. How come I don't? Yeah. And the, they're showing pictures, so they got pictures to say, oh, yeah, I remember this was really cool when I went down to Laguna Beach. Oh, I went to the Grand Canyon. Oh, I stayed in Flagstaff. So I, I think the, the, the bragging challenges the individual to go out and explore more. Like, oh, there's a mountain. I'm going to drive on top of this mountain. Oh, here's the desert. I've never been to the desert. So they'll do that to break to their friend, which is good. That's just going to make them cover more ground. Uh, but don't worry. They'll have plenty of time where that cell phone won't work. Just play. You go out east, it's, it's a different problem. But you go west of the Mississippi, it's going to be 1987 all over for those. And they'll listen to the Jesus and country stations. They will listen to those stations. Yeah, actually, I'm glad you brought that up, and, and that reframes my perspective on on that topic. Um, so, Aaron, I'm I'm really glad that you brought that up, because yeah, I mean, if you are taking uh, taking the pictures and you're sharing it, of course, it is meaning something to you, and you are mm -hmm. going to go back and, and you're going to reflect on that. Um, I had, so I, I'm going to take a little little time warp back uh, when I was. I don't know, 18 or 19, well, one of my roommates and I in college, we decided to spring break. And we were going to drive to Little Rock, Arkansas. Why? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. You know, it's just like pre-internet days. Oh, man. Like, you know, we're looking at a map. I'm like, how about Little Rock? You know, we're like, yeah, Little Rock. There's like, <laughs> there was not one thing that we had on a destination for Little Rock. So we end up, the first thing we do is we go to Minnesota because the Brewers are playing the Twins at the Metrodome. <laughs> Right. And and in front of us in the outfield seats, uh, some guy's waving a brewer's flag and uh, somebody sets it on fire. And, uh, you know, so we're talking, you know, what, I don't know, 23 years ago, maybe something like that. You know, and security comes and they got to, you know, stamp this flag out and the 
guys get ejected something like well that was something to see i'll never forget that but um you know we go down to little rock arkansas and it, it was it was actually uh it's 91 so it was the start of the uh iraq war and right. i didn't realize we were trying to to stay in um you know uh, god springfield missouri we is like okay. 11 12 at night we roll into springfield missouri and, and it's like we got to find a place to stay you need a shower you know all this other stuff and just kick back and you didn't realize like they wouldn't they wouldn't give a hotel to you unless you're 21 right so right. no yeah, matter yeah. what like we're screwed like had no idea on that so i'm thinking so you know we kind of regroup and i'm like okay follow my lead because i'm pretty good at this improv stuff so uh you know my roommate and i go in <clears throat> I got a map and I'm like, where's this military base? And, you know, I'm asking the person at the front and, and I said, and they're like, why? And I said, uh, you know, we're part of a computer program, you know, uh, it, uh, we're in computer programming. You know, we've been called in to go to this base. Um, there, there's some issue we're, we're needed to work with. I, I don't know any more than that. We're tired. You know, it's this whole thing of like the, what was that? Real Genius with Val Kilmer. You remember that movie? Yeah, yeah. I okay, so it's kind of that whole thing of like, you know, I'm coming in and, and I'm just playing it like, you know, we totally belong. Like, this is totally. And I'm like, you know, if you could just do us a solid, you know, we can pay it in cash. And I know the whole thing, but, you know, we were supposed to be able to make it down to the base in one day and we got hung up and boom, the tone changed. You know, the tone <laughs> changed. The guys like, yeah, no problem. Totally got it. Like, what's going on? I'm like, I don't know. It's just. You know, we're, we work Can't a lot. Say. You know. So, yeah, anything you guys need, you know, you're all set, you know. And, and uh, it was the coolest thing. My roommate's just shaking, you know, he's just looking at me. He's white. I'm like, dude, do not, do not crack. Like, this is working, okay? So, you know, we do that. We stay. But then the only thing I remember is we got pulled over by, like, a cop who just said, you can't have radar detectors down here. I'm like, oh, I'm Okay, you know, learned it. We'll put it away. You know, he was fine. But yeah, it was pointless. It was point. We had no purpose and reconnaissance. I, it wasn't a place we wanted to live. I, I remember like one of the most amazing things we filled up with gas, and and the gas pump still had those those analog numbers that rolled around. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm yeah. like, oh my goodness, man! I mean, this was like gone from my hometown 10, 15 years ago. <laughs> you know, and you're wondering what's sucking up from the bottom of this the tank underneath, but. Um, but yeah, you know, so we did we did this, but it wasn't reconnaissance. We never planned. We never had. It, who goes to Little Rock, Arkansas? How stupid was that? But, um, but again, I'll, I'm going to bring it back to to your book. I mean, I think you really challenge the younger generation in a great way to one say, what am I interested in? Because if I, if we would have planned that trip of what we're interested in, I mean, we probably would have coordinated around like even spring break baseball, you know, like going down to like Arizona cactus league type stuff right. and maybe focus more in on something that at least made sense, but you know, it was just pointless. So, you know, what you've done in your book, I think is, is to really give people, give, give the younger generation, um, that, that pause of saying, okay, what do you really want to do with your life? And at least get out there and know what is out there and then what your interests are. And I remember, you know, we were in Florida back in March and, and I read something, you know, in this little magazine about Florida. The highest mountain, I guess, mountain they call it, was 400 feet. Well, like, well obviously, if you're hiking, that's you're never going to go to Florida. Plus, like, you know, to get anywhere from Florida, you, you got to drive forever. Right. Oh, then, it's on the far. Yeah. It's yeah. the furthest state except for Alaska and Maine. It's, so it's like, you know, that's that's pointless. I mean, if you're into that, that's just not going to be your place. I mean, maybe for other things it will be. But um, but yeah, I mean, I. I that Little Rock, Arkansas story still sticks with me because people will say, well, why'd you go to Little Rock, Arkansas? I'm like, I, I have no idea. I'm like, oh. I, have, I have no idea why I didn't gain. I mean, we gained some self-sufficiency. That was pre-internet days. Mm -hmm. We had to understand. Learn maps and everything. The maps yeah. and, right, and right. how to kind of BS our way around, you know, some certain things. But um, but today but, it's it's a lot. You see, and, and I kind of made a similar mistake and it wasn't pre-internet, but it was kind of there, there wasn't much on the internet. And as I went to New Mexico, instead of going to Arizona, and if you don't know the difference between New Mexico and Arizona, Arizona is a nice, very pretty state <laughs> with the Grand Canyon and Phoenix and Flagstaff and Tucson, a nice little quaint hall called Bisbee. And New Mexico is a dump that should be given back to old uh, old Mexico. 
Um, <clears throat> it's garbage. People literally leave garbage in their yards. Albuquerque is 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 not dangerous, just dirty, and it's cactus and dry. It's ugly. Uh, but the the larger point is today, kids, they can research everything on the internet now. And they're not going to make the mistake of going to Arkansas. They're like, what's in Arkansas? I'm like, well, there's a diamond mine nearby and there's the Ozarks, but there's nothing else. So what I think kids can do is cut down on simple exploration costs. They don't have to go here and try it out. They don't have to go there and try it. And that's a good thing because your average 18, 19 year old kid doesn't have a huge budget. Uh, so they could go online and kind of whittle it down like, OK, this town or this state, or this area has some interesting things going on in it, and that would be the best expenditure and use of our time for our two weeks off, our month off, or whatever we're gonna do for this summer. Uh, so I think, especially now, you, you can look up stuff, you get videos, pictures, everything, everything. You can research, I mean, I have, you and I remember, what was it like? Go get the encyclopedia, look at it. Oh, hey, here's a picture of Britain. It looks like it's raining, and, and that was the extent of it. <laughs> right. Now you can get a live cam feed. What does London look like right now? Oh, hey, it's yes. dark. Oh, that's right. It's night over there. You know, uh, so the the if you do it right, just a little bit of upfront work. Yeah, you're going to save yourself tons of money, thousands of dollars. And I don't think any kid today. Well, you never know. I hope most kids would know enough to do some research on the Internet first before saying, hey, let's strike off to Arkansas. You know, so uh, I'm not I'm not too worried. Now, there are other things like you bring up. Uh, you know, 18 year olds can't rent an apartment or I'm sorry, a hotel. Uh, you got to be 25 in, in most states to rent a car. So I, I address that in the book as well. OK, look, you're going to have to get a, a car or have your dad lend you one or something like that. You're going to have to use cash a lot because, you know, a lot of people don't get credit cards. Um, there's there's hurdles, but it's nothing that you and I didn't handle. Like I remember what considered be my first trip out west. I was 19. I took my Ford Escort. I drove it out to the Black Hills in the Badlands of South Dakota. I slept in the trunk, parked at churches, and I had like $200 cash on me, and that's how I paid for it. And, you know, I got granola bars and soda waters and, and drove out there. And this was even before Walmarts were out in these. We could just crash yeah. and get anything you wanted 24-7. So, I mean, it's not like it was the 1880s and we we're going through oxen pulled cart. <laughs> right. But today, I, I, I get a little bit of flack and guff from the, the millennial. Why do we do this? How do we do I'm like, well, you find a way. It's not that hard. You'll find a way. Get some money. Get some cash and go do it, you know. So um, unless the parents are particularly strict, which there's some helicopter parents, you know, are, we're not going to give you the car. We're, no, you can't leave. You live under these house, these rules, that sort of thing. So that's something that I can't, I can't fix. But you can do it. You can really do it if you want. It's just it's going to take a little bit of pre-planning and cash. So um, a couple years ago on YouTube, maybe two years ago, I, I discovered, I was just typing in, you know, Mississippi River boat, you know, canoeing and stuff because my dad and I had done, you know, some of that, um, not Mississippi River, but did, had done quite a bit of canoeing um, when I was growing up. But um, I, I found there was a, a series that was put together. It was two brothers from Portage, Indiana, and they were both college kids, you know, probably like 20 years old. And they they had a documentary that they assembled, you know, and it was pretty rough. You know, it's just they just set up the camcorder in their tent or outside or whatever. But, you know, it was like day one, day two. And they started it wherever the Mississippi starts, which I don't know where it is. Somewhere. Uh, Itasca Falls, Minnesota. OK, yes, yes. Yeah. So they start there and they work all the way down to within, you know, like 10 miles of the Gulf of Mexico. And then, you know, their their dad comes and picks them up. So as you watch this video, you get to see the challenges, you know, like the tent leaked last night and all of our stuff got soaked. So we had to go to whatever, but then how people would help them out. You right. Know, like we, we got up to this one dam and then you had to like take the canoe, whatever, but there was some guy in a pickup truck that showed up and he's like, Hey, can I help you? And, and, you know, we'll take you in and buy you a meal or like our can opener puked it out. So we had to <laughs> go to a local store and get another one. But this amazing progression of just how they, they, they got to handle things they understood like when they came up to the locks like you know the best way to get the attention of whoever the locks person was they would mm -hmm. you know toot the horn and raise the water and whatever but but you could see them grow and see their independence and their confidence and, and initially 
And, and I'm watching this thinking, my God, this had to be the coolest thing for you two guys to do. Even though, like, it totally sucked at times. Mm-hmm. You got rained on. Bolts were running up close to you, trying to flip you over just to see if you know, they could. <laughs> you know, you're out at night, and, t- and, and these barges are throwing spotlights to blind you just for the, the entertainment of the, the guys on the barges. Um, and, and all these things. But at the same time, you know, you're talking about how um, – you know, you're 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 pulling off into some place, yeah, and, and someone is is inviting you, you know, up for a meal or to like mm. do a load of laundry quick or something. And it was the most amazing thing. I, I got a hold of these guys and and I just I, I just talked to them a little bit about their story. I'm like, hey, I just watched this and you know, I kind of I, I'm just telling you, this was really cool. Like I just want to thank you for putting this on. I never did this. I wish I would have. Like I know there were challenges and probably times when you just wanted to, to call home and say like, it's done, but you work through it. Like you fought through it in, and this experience, and then also the parents, you know, having to be like, you know, I'm not sure if we should, should go along with this or not, but mm-hmm. you know, well, they're 19 and 20. I mean, they're going to figure it out or they're going to die. And this is what they wanted to do. I mean, it's almost that simple. Um, but it's like those, they'll remember that forever. And they forged mm-hmm. independence. They've had to, to problem solve. Um, you know, and, and these were not kids or kids. I mean, you and I, I guess, refer to them as kids, but I mean, they were resourceful. They're not talking about like, I called home last night or I did this. I'm sure they had their check-ins, but it was the most amazing thing. And I, I'm just like, I could hire these two for any type of job. I'm sure oh, yeah. they, they yeah, could figure out where yep. they want to go, like and, yep. and for their, for their lives. They could figure out problem solving. Um, and and the fact that they did this experience at this one time in life when they don't have kids, they're not married, they don't, don't have, have kids, these yes. other things that are, and 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 whatever liberated them from jobs because I think they had a few weeks that they did this. So I'm like, oh, this was so cool. And, and you know, we get back. You, you know, you talk about high school and classes and things like that. I think I graduated fifth in my class, which might sound like a, a huge accomplishment, although we had like 44 kids. You know, so. Um, but when I was a senior, Aaron, I was a senior, my last semester, all of my friends were taking plastics taught by Mr. Steber, who was retired. Plastics. Oh, so, my gosh. So plastics. Plastics class. It's like the graduate. <laughs> so Do you remember that? Yes, sir. And uh, and all my friends were in plastics, and they got to make things like a plastic duck and a plastic bank. And they got to make these really cool fiberglass sleds. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm missing out. So I dropped trigonometry like two and a two to three weeks in and I remember the trig teacher sitting down with me and, and he was like, you're going to regret this. You're going to regret this. This is a bad move, David. You're going to regret this. And I'm like in the room right in back of me, Aaron, I still have that sled that I take out with my daughters and that thing doesn't even have a chip in it because it was made to last into this yeah. fiberglass sled. I still have, you know, that, that plastic bank thing that I made, but I mean, I learned so much and just you know to, to to be with my friends versus this academic stuff which i just picked up on my own or picked up a year later but it was one of those things too of being like man you know you you, you gotta you gotta decide on your own too and i think that's where this whole thing and, my, and thankfully my parents went along with it which was pretty amazing my dad um my dad was a school principal for 35 years, was actually my principal when I was K-8. So imagine that. Good. That would suck. <laughs> that would just, I'd hike to a different school. I get, Dad, give me a bike. I'll go to the next school. I'll go to Grafton. So, Whatever I got to do. He, you know, he's, he's a great guy. But yeah, that, that, was, a, that was a bizarre situation. But, uh, but, you know, my parents went along with it. So that was pretty cool. And, and like I said, I, what I learned from that, and I also learned the thing of you were never sick because if you were sick, Everybody would take all your projects, and if your project was better than theirs at that phase, they would swap it out. <laughs> so you'd come back, and I'd be like, I don't remember my sled having a big crack in the side of it. I'm like, what's up over here, you know? So, um, you know, like that was another motivation. Never get sick, you know, because all your work is going to be be commandeered, and, and you're going to mm-hmm. end up having to redo everything. But um, so, yeah, watching watching that video, I think, was was really cool of those 20-year-olds. And, and it reminded me of the embodiment of Reconnaissance Man as I listened to it. I, I mean, I hadn't thought about this, Aaron, for th- two, three years. And all of a sudden, after listening to your book, um, it, it just popped forward. I'm like, these guys, these guys were Reconnaissance Men. Yep, they were they out are. there. They were Reconnaissance Men. They had their plan, but they were problem-solving. They were in the moment. They were soaking it in. They were doing their video journal. And, God, I mean, if you met them today... 
I bet they've got their feet on the ground. Now, I could totally be wrong on this, and, and they 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 just know it. Um, so I guess you know, as I, I'm kind of with you. Like I I need the glasses, so they don't have them on. So like if I print it really big, I can still make it <laughs> out. Like oh my god, when did that happen? Um, so I guess in in kind of wrapping up reconnaissance, man. I'll, I'll just give a first of, of I'm, I'm producing a review that will show up on Amazon. I did download it on Audible just for the fact that I have a commute and I prefer to listen. Versus, yeah, I don't know why anyone reads anymore. Yeah. That's Yeah, Audible just, is the way to go. Yeah. So and you have, a, I think, Jim Fear. Um, oh, yeah, Jim. Yeah, he, he does the audio book. Yeah, he does the narration. Yeah. Yeah. So so your book, uh, listening to Jim, it, you know, he... He's uh, he's dynamic, a very comfortable voice to listen he's to. 22. <laughs> he's twenty two. He's twenty two. Kids got, got hustle, man. Kids got hustle, and, and that's why I mean, like, here's your money. Yeah, go, go, man. You go and do. So yeah, he's twenty two. He's got he's got good game. So the book is very professionally narrated. Um, mm-hmm. Aaron does a nice job, um, you know, with the, with the chapters. And I, of course, Aaron, I mean, you're. You've you've published um, a number of books, so I mean you mm-hmm. you've you've got this down. You know when you put together a book of how to develop the the introduction, the background. Um, but reconnaissance, man, for me, even being forty five, and you know taking my first trip down to to Disney and back with the car and and stuff like that, and you know when we're planning some other trips, we're going out to we're going to do a West Coast and we're going to kind of do an East Coast coming up. And um, but I'm telling you, for for anybody listening, reconnaissance, man. By Aaron Clary, go in and and download it, or if you're old fashioned, you know, get it in in a paper format or Kindle or whatever you do with that. But, but actually, I I prefer the download. I I thought, um, I, you know, listening to Jim, he's he's very articulate and he brings to life, you know, your your words. But I I listen to the book at it. Well, I mean, I listened to it more than three times, but the first time was just what I would say reconnaissance listening. Mm-hmm. So I just wanted to know what it was about. And then the second time, I'm kind of honing in more on the details. And then the third time, I'm really going through kind of writing my notes and coming up with some of the questions today of like, how do you actually, when you're out there, document what you're seeing because um, and what you're feeling? Because once you come back, it kind of all blends together. And you, and you note it with your journal, you know, your journaling. And I think there's electronic ways to do that. You know, so I think that question has been answered. Um and it, it definitely <laughs> don't live in the cold states. Don't live in the cold Dude. states. God, no, don't come here. This it's is just horrible. Learn from our mistakes. See, everyone laughs. They roll. Oh, it's not that bad. It's like, no, you don't get it. You don't get it. No. Life is too short for this. Go Mason Dixon line right. or lower. Seriously, right. Mason Dixon or, or short. Or, I mean, I'll grant Colorado and and. Um, Idaho, maybe a, a cut and a break in South Dakota, but man, there's no reason, no reason to be in the upper Midwest, none whatsoever. I'm, uh, I'm helping a friend of mine. Uh, she's moving to, uh, Arizona. I don't know the city, but, um, had built a house down there mm-hmm. and she's moving on June 23rd. So I'm going to help her load her U-Haul. Um, and, and I'm just thinking, uh, lucky you. I mean, <laughs> lucky lucky you i mean she's talking about you know this area and, and stuff like that because i'm like i'm i know i'm going to be getting an email for you in, in you know december january oh yeah pictures and oh yeah, yeah. and uh that's what i do to my friends i'm like hey look i'm hiking yeah. and the sun is out there's no snow <laughs> and, and you know i go out and i run you know i, I run Aaron almost every night and mm. um even in winter you know so and, and when you're in wisconsin you run it's you put on the layers, so you're putting on the long underwear, the insulated socks, the boots, double the socks, yeah, the cleats. Yep. I put cleats on the boots because I I fell a couple times in the last year and I didn't do any damage, but I'm like, you know, I'm not as young as I used to be, no, no, and I don't need to be hopping around at 45, 46 with a broken hip, but um, but yeah, I mean, it's literally a production, and and the you know the winter, the the big gloves which are down <laughs> 30 below, and and you just you know the thing over your head, and then the thing over that, and all and all that time. All that time when I now I, I vacation down south, I I'm spoiled rotten. I'd basically just go and sleep on people's couches, different fans and friends I've made over the years. Um, but another thing is like the amount of time you save not bundling up. I just get out, put on sandals, walk out and get my coffee. It's 75 degrees at 8 a.m. It just go south. You don't have you don't have to suffer this. You don't have to be here. You could you could go so you can Airbnb. <laughs> 
for two months. And it's worth the fifteen hundred dollars, whatever it is you're going to pay. Just, just go do it. So, so Eric, anything else on reconnaissance, man, that, that you want to add? Uh, it's it's not just for kids or college age kids or kids trying. To, I mean, it is for every because very few people I know know what they want to do in life. The sad truth is most people die not knowing what they want to do in life, and they die with regrets. Um, and to ever so briefly, um explain because i know everyone on the east coast thinks it's still the original 13 colonies um east of the mississippi just sucks there's nothing there hey, there's some smoky mountains all right it sucks get over yourself all right there is so much cool stuff in the west you have no idea and even if you're not going to do reconnaissance and you're not going to take this kind of zen approach to it please visit canyonlands national park uh Grand Canyon National Park, Zion National Park, Rocky, you owe it to yourself and your kids to throw everyone in a station wagon or minivan or whatever it is today. Just haul out there and go explore the West. That You absolutely do it. And if you're a younger person and you don't know what to do after going to college, you don't have to. You're going to get a lot of backlash and pressure from your parents. Like, you have to go to college. You have to go to college. You got to be doing something. You got to be doing and, and there's going to be shame. You'll bring shame to this family if you don't. I've, I've actually seen that. Uh, you have to now right. start separating yourself. You are 18. You can smoke. You can get drafted and get shot. And on top of that, that means you are also an adult and you should start acting like it. And one of the first things you got to do is figure out what you want to do as an adult. And right now you have this cacophony of nothingness told you. I'd say you're often misled, like you must go to college and you must do this. And I don't care. Any degree is a good degree. And that will um, ruin you in a lot of instances, especially if you go to school for the wrong thing. It can ruin your finances for a decade and delay your growth as an adult for a decade. So please take two years, three years, four years, even if you have to, to figure out what you want to do and what you want to be in life. Before you stop dropping four years of your youth and 70, 80 grand worth in tuition on college. Um, it's it's infinite. I, I almost I did a video on this, how people go to college twice. They go to school for what they want to. They find out they don't get paid. Then they inevitably go to school a second time and have to get a whole completely new degree. Well, why don't you just not go to school and have a lot more fun driving around, figuring things out, exploring the world and having experiences and then go to school for it. You absolutely do know you want to do where you want to be, and you have the context by which to execute that plan. Uh, instead of just blindly going like you, me, and pretty much anyone else before the interwebs, uh, did, you know, oh, okay, we'll do that because you said so. So it, it, execute independent thought. Think logically. Think common sense. And just because people poo-poo it or say, oh, it's a dumb idea or it's not, it goes against common wisdom or co common sense. Common wisdom and common sense – well, not common sense. Common wisdom leads to common lives, all right? And you're yes. going to have a common life yes. if you file common advice. So you have to think independently and think, not feel, oh, I like this. So I'm going to run off and play acoustic guitar in California. They tried it in the 60s. It didn't work out good for any of them. <laughs> you got to think this one through and take your time. There's absolutely no rush. And, and I'm sure the doc probably agree with me. If we were to do it all over again, we'd be having completely different lives. Still, we'd probably have the same people in our life, you know, married, kids, whatever. Right. Uh, but it would be warmer. We'd be happier. We'd probably be richer, less debt. Um, and I know this happens, especially since I started hanging out in the, in, in, uh, in the South during winter. We'd be healthier. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Because you're just, I mean, I know, I remember wintertime, I'd pack on about 10 to 15 pounds, as everyone does. And, but down South, I lose 5 to 10 pounds because you're just banging up mountains. So yeah, just please read reconnaissance, man. Even if you if you kind of know what you want to do, um, because it'll give you other ideas. And if anything, chapter six itself is basically a travel guide to the United States. It just goes over the coolest places to go to the U.S. So before you die, read chapter six as a travel guide and hit those spots, and and you'll then you'll have much less regrets upon your deathbed than you will now. And Aaron, it, chapter six you talked about was it like. Um uh, there were some Native American ruins, which are, were similar to the Anasazi ruins, but it was like the version where you didn't have to pay to. to oh, they're all them. over. They're yeah. all over. Yeah. 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 You could find them um, as far north as Washington and far south as well, because all in Mexico. But yeah. And just because and you got to realize there was they estimate around two million um, Utah Indians 
in the American West. Wow. And, and they, they obviously made their presence known. And just because, like, oh, hey, here's Mesa Verde. That's it. Mesa yes. Verde yeah, National Mesa Park. Verde. Yes. They'll say, oh, you got to go here and you got to pay your $25. You got to drive 20 miles into the park. Well, just outside Cortez for free is Canyon of the Ancients. You walk 500 yards, you'll see more adobe dwellings than you could have. You think, oh, it's really cool. But after the 56 ones, you're like, okay, I think I've seen enough adobe dwellings. Yeah, there are a lot of these people here. Yeah, so it's- I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of wrap up on, on Reconnaissance Man. Again, um, there will be my personal um, review of Reconnaissance Man will be showing up on Amazon um, before long. You know, I want to make sure that I, that I am able to articulate all of my main points. And it is going to receive five stars from me. It is. Thanks. I, I, it, I'll give you more of my books then. Yeah, <laughs> go, yeah I'll send them all to you. But yeah. And Aaron, I had to, if you saw the configuration I had to do to get it from, from uh, Audible into MP3, like kind of this roundabout oh. thing. Uh, it's a little tricky with that, but but anybody listening, you know, don't don't worry about that. Um, but I I felt, um, yeah, I mean, my my brain, you know, if 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 there was an MRI going on, it would have just been you know white with light as I'm listening to this because I'm like I relate to this, I relate to this, and you lay it out without all of the. Um, you know, the, the verbose nature that typically takes in a lot of books. I mean, you get right there. And that's what I like about your work. That's what I like about your podcast. Um, and and this is a book I highly recommend. Um, and it was a real pleasure for me to to purchase it, to listen to it, you know, numerous times. I mean, I still have it on my, you know, I, I there, if I were to fire it up and go running later tonight and to listen to it, I would have the same um excitement that the same pleasure out of listening to it as the first time i mean it's a book that just doesn't doesn't become old with me um because it it, it just helps that reflection process so anybody out there reconnaissance man by aaron clary and as you get into that you can identify um, the numerous works that aaron has has published and explore those also and with that i want to bridge aaron into um i believe is your latest work as an essay Poor Richard's Retirement for Everyday mm. Americans. Mm. This one strikes uh, uh, even closer to home for me, um, you know, because I, I've done a lot with retirement planning. I was very disciplined. Um, I, I remember, you know, I I remember being 12 years old and working at a concrete factory that was two blocks away from my house. Even though you didn't have a work permit, they somehow mm-hmm. let that happen because my yep, brother three dollars an hour. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my pay stubs. Yeah, you know, hey, I went from two ninety five to to three ten. You know, this one year, and uh, and I worked at a, at a swimming pool, um, helping to set up the lessons. I don't know, like a program director thing. It wasn't like a lifeguard, but that was like another couple blocks from my house. And I would go to like football practice, and then I would work like thirty hours a week, and like on the weekend I would do this. Um, and I would save my money and I put it into CDs, which back then actually paid you eight know, to seven percent. Yeah. yeah, no, this, this, yeah, you know, that was that was some great stuff. Um, and but I remember just being very wise and very diligent with my money. And then as I started to to work, um, to put money into four hundred one k and to to take out you know Roth IRAs, as we were able to do that, and, and just that we're very, you know, we're we're always making. I thought very fiscally wise decisions, which is so much outside of the norm of anybody I know in my peer mm-hmm. group, anybody, even people who make two, three, four times the amount of money that I make. They spend um, five to six times that amount. It, it's That's- just gone. And and the part is, it not it, it used to just become an indifference to me. Um, and, and again, I haven't, I haven't acquired the essay. I've written, uh, I've read some some reviews, some excerpts, some things like that. So I need to get it, but, um, but it, but it's actually become Aaron on It's become this, this, this part where I'm very frustrated. Like I'm almost angry at my peers mm-hmm. because I'm like, you know, you're okay. This is, you just took this vacation, which you can't afford. And you just put it on a credit card, which you intend to default on in, you know, six to eight months and then just get another card or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you know, and you bring up, some of these people on CCAP, which is the Wisconsin Circuit Court thing, and you can see all of the credit card companies or the different, you know, here's Creditors, the window company that, right. is, that is is suing them now because they haven't paid their bill for the new windows in their house or whatever. And I'm like, or, or, I'm just like, ah, 
I, you know, it's like playing by the rules. You kind of feel almost punished by by doing that. Yet, you know, I'm not going to change because I do think frugality and, and being very reasonable. And I don't think we're limiting. It's not like, you know, we did save up and we had the Disney trip and we had the things like that. My my oldest daughter, Erin, so, you know, each of my daughters, we said, you know, we could take some money to Disney out of your savings account and, and buy things. And my oldest daughter is very conservative. And, and she took $50, like, total. <laughs> so we get down there. <laughs> and I'm like... I just said, oh, honey, I'm like, I, you know, we'll supplement you a little bit if you, if you need to. Um, but, you know, she would weigh her purchases and her things like that. Mm-hmm. And I don't even know if she spent the $50. It was just the experience yep. and family time. But it, could you tell us about poor Richard's retirement? Because this is something that is terrifying. Um, you know, I feel like we are prepared for retirement and helping prepare ourselves better. And, and, and before I get into that, I'm going to branch off. You've talked about this many times in your podcast. I admire, mm-hmm. I admire this in you, Aaron. You have, you know, multiple income streams, and you've continued to foster those income streams. You've taught classes. You know, you have your online classes, and mm-hmm. you update them, but they've been available. Those are income streams. Your consulting income streams. Your books, mm-hmm. those income streams. Um, and and uh, you know, when you're ballroom dance instructing while you were a banker, income mm-hmm. ancillary income stream. Um, so, you know, you've done and, and the, the security guard and, and so many things, which obviously you just don't talk about in podcasts, but but you've built these multiple streams to come in to, to give you this incredible resiliency, which I see. I mean, I think you've you. Oh, have, I answered a no one. Yeah, I, I mean, I. Yes. yes. I, it's I'm, I'm no boss. No one. I answer to no one. Yeah, and it's, it's almost better than the money I make just to, to, to have no boss. Yeah. And I think that is so. Um, it, it's doable. I mean, people can do that. And, and I had shared with you earlier, um, I've taught university courses uh, since 2002. And over that time span, I mean, for different universities, but I primarily teach for, for one, but just as a side job, not as a primary job, just as a side job. And, um, you know, I made a gross about 200000 over 15 years. Well, you know, that paid off my mortgage, paid off our cars, yep. um, you know, allowed us to do some modest, you know, remodeling, take out some carpets and things like that, just because of, of that. And and some of the, the other things, you know, like the, the books, you know, that's all kind of ancillary, plus um, the expert witness stuff just kind of developed. That's, you know, the hustle, and you've got that Hustle. I don't have it to the degree that you have it, but you know, well, you got I, kids got too. Those. Kids sap hustle. I don't so, know if you know. <laughs> Kid, I don't know if you knew this. Kids take energy. Did you know kids take energy to race? I don't know if you knew that or not, but they. Yeah, yeah. My, you just uh, can't water them, and they take care of themselves. They require a little bit more than that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, yeah, um, tomorrow morning, I mean, I'll be running one to soccer, another to swim, then another to soccer, and then another to swim, and you know, then we'll get home and, and do more. But. Um, Poor Richard's retirement for everyday Americans. What's it about, and why should people, why should people purchase it? I, I'm deadly serious when I say this. It's not for salesmanship or shock value. It should be the number one New York Times bestseller, number one on Amazon, because it is written for people who didn't save up enough for retirement, and that is pretty much everybody except for 15 percent of the baby boomers, because that's the only group of people they're on the precipice of retiring, but they're they're the uh, that's the The only group of people that have saved up enough is 15%. 85% have failed. They don't have enough. Only 15% of the people who are of retirement age have saved up enough for retirement. And so I did is I took a look at what we typically assume in conventional modern day financial planning, retirement planning. And I said, okay, you have some assumptions that just don't have to be true. Like you need $50,000 a year to live per person. That is not true. If you replace and get replace consumer spending, repl- replace materialism with good conversation, the love of your spouse, the love of your children, the love of your friends, intellectual stimulation, podcasts, anything, just not buying things, not buying new cars, getting used cars, getting by with it, not having to go out to eat all the time, not having to buy fancy booze, not having to buy fancy cars. If you just put human interaction, human engagement, and, and this doesn't mean you don't travel or have fun, but you put that at the number one thing in your life, you can get by on about 15 to 20 grand per year, all right? At, at, at this assumes many things in your retirement. You have the house right. paid off and all this other stuff. But right. if you are a minimalist, you are frugal, not cheap, frugal, 
and you don't waste your money over the course of your life on stupid BS, you do not need that much to save for retirement. It's $160,000, I estimate, in today's dollars. That's the bare minimum, 200 preferable. You're pretty easily set around three. Uh, modern day, at minimum, you need 500,000. The problem is, how do you get rid of consumption spending? How do you get rid of materialism? Because that's ingrained. You, you yourself mentioned all these people that are trying to uh, uh, cheat the Windows guy or the their suppliers or the vendors or the credit card companies. They, and the, the concept of a credit card is like, well, you obviously don't make as much money as you need to because you spend more. The fact you have accruing debt means you're right. spending more. Right. People are addicted to consumption, and there's a whole addiction mentality there. It's tied into uh, uh, genetics, evolution, how we survived. And I specifically address that and try to eliminate it by supplanting consumerism with the value and love for your fellow human being. So it's not like, hey, stop spending less. That's like telling someone, hey, stop eating as much. It doesn't work. Everyone knows what to do when it comes to a diet. Everybody knows what to do uh, when it comes to a budget. It's getting people the incentive to reprogram their brains to actually do it. And that's what, and I'm sorry, that's what poor Richard's retirement does. So it does go through some numbers uh, to say, hey, look, this is what all you really need. So the hurdle has come down way low that it is easily within people's grasp. The everyday man can retire very easily today. The real hard part, and that's where the meat and the bones comes into the, into the essay, is how do you get rid of your addiction to spending? And so I think I've done, not to brag, I think I've done a better job than any other book or philosophy or anything else I've seen out there on retirement planning. Um, of course, you know, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I don't have a contract with Penguin Publishing or anything like that, but it is probably, depending on where you are in life, but if you're out of college and uh, you're starting to think about retirement planning at all, that's the, that's the number one book you should be getting uh, because of its very utilitarian value. And also it's philosophical value because got news for you. I don't know anyone that in my days in banking that pulled up in a leased Range Rover or a leased Mercedes or a leased anything because they didn't actually have the money to afford it. None of them were happy. Everybody came in in a fancy car were miserable because they put things ahead of humans. And so if you put humans ahead of things, not only your finances are going to drastically improve, you're going to be happier. You're going to have a much better life. And so that's where more of the philosophical, I guess, maybe the more moral lesson of that essay uh, comes in. But uh, how you get there, you'd have to buy it and find out. <laughs> yeah. And what's happiness? Happiness isn't worth five dollars on Kindle. Uh, you go buy, go buy your BMWs. Go get an Xbox One and and go get yourself a sixty-inch screen TV. That's that'll lead to happiness. Forget that seven-dollar audio book or whatever it is online. <laughs> you Who know needs what? happiness for seven bucks? Uh, a couple of years ago, so where I live next door to me is uh, it lived a, a doctor, and he actually had a number of clinics he had started, mm-hmm. and uh, he built a, a, I don't know a very elaborate pond in his backyard with the the koi fish and the special netting and everything. So just to preface this, like my house is not comparable to the house next door. <laughs> next door, I call it the servants' quarters, you know. Yeah. Like, so, um, but it would be the funniest thing because. He would put his garbage out, all right? He'd put his garbage out, and, you know, I'd be like, man, like, those are brand new shelves. Like, I could put those in my garage. So I would go out, and I'd take them. You pill them, yeah, 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 yeah. And there would be, like, I'm like, dude, you know, and, and there was, there's so much in, in my house, like, that I just acquired, which was, like, just mint. Where he'd be like, you know, I don't I don't need this lawnmower anymore. I, I upgraded it. So I just put a free just sign. Take I'm like, it. free? Uh, I'm like, free's oh, good. God. And then, uh. But, you know, one of the things you talk about happiness. So I had I had a black car in a, a black SUV at that time. You know, neither, you know, neither were new. And he had like, he had the equivalent. He had the black BMW. Now, I didn't mm-hmm. have a BMW. You know, I got the Chevy version. He's got the BMW. He's got the black uh, car, the black SUV. So, so and then, like, he you know, cool. I got the small snowblower. And he's got like the big one with all the cranks and the four-wheel drive crap and all of that stuff. So I told my wife, I said, you know, just observing one day, I'm like, Everything that we have, they have like three steps above the exact same thing, which didn't bother me. I didn't care. Yeah. But I would get a kick out of like he'd blow the leaves off his yard and he'd blow them under his fence, like onto my property. I'm like, dude, dude, like, you know, this isn't cool. Okay. Like, but yet, like, um, you talk about happiness. Like, the guy was always like, I mowed an inch over on his property 
and and he would be out and he would just be like here's your property line this is where you mow i'm like come on i'm doing you a favor like i'll just i'll just mow this little patch between us so it'll always look level and and uh and yeah he had some times like you know when his kids would be outside and they'd be fighting and yelling and i'm just like you are not happy. Like your bank is account not happy. is fat, you know, and all of that. And you're driving, you know, driving these these expensive vehicles. But dude, and he's gone. He's moved. You know, he's he's been out of here since. But I, I just remember I'm like, what an unhappy, like what an unhappy person. The fact I can be outside and uh instead of just, you know, striking up a conversation with me, you're like, you know, here here's the property line, you know. I'm not sure if they told you this when you moved in. I'm like, nope, nope. They didn't. They didn't tell me. And by the way, like for you to tell me this, like, come on, get a get a life doc. You know, don't you have other things to to kind of worry about here? But ah, uh, my God. And then on the other side, you know, I got neighbors like, um, you know, there there's a tree like on our side that needed to be removed, like a big oak tree, and they're having one removed. And the guys like, yeah, why don't I just take? I'll have them take that one out for you too. I'm like, mm. but don't I owe you money for this? Like, no, no. Nah. I got, I got a you know, guys like you know, retired out of accountant, you know, he's like in his eighties, he and his wife, mm-hmm. and they're just like, Yeah, don't worry about it. We'll just I mean, it's like a thousand bucks or whatever. Like, don't worry about it. Yeah, you you're great neighbors. We like we love having you here. And um I'm just like I don't know. You know, just but you're right, you know, just it's just people and and um I I shared just recently, uh, you know, I'm I'm starting I'm actually my podcast is starting to grow. I mean I'm I'm I, I I'm a 32 podcast, so you know I'm I'm in the infancy. Uh, I'm nowhere near as established as you, and I, I probably will never get to that level. Well, if um, I die, you'll catch up, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> or if I could, you know, get get someone, you know, through Fiverr to hijack your account and go in and switch. Yeah, you the Leo, right? Yeah, me, but uh, never underestimate <laughs> death. <laughs> but but yeah, you know, I I I enjoy the podcasting. I've met a lot of really cool people through podcasting and I've been invited onto some shows and it's been fun for me to talk on these different shows about um some of the things that are in my wheelhouse and and you know which is more into, you know, just high stakes decision making and, and stuff like that. I'm on a show tomorrow night and then next week I'm on a different show and you get this all the time here. I mean, you you're you know, you're to to have you on my show um you know, it is, it's really an honor for me because, uh, you know, the, the shows that, that you've been on and, and the work that you've, you've done, um, you know, the fact that you've considered being on my show, I really take that as a, as an, as an honor. I mean, well, it's I'm not like, Ivan and Reitman on so. if they're even still around. I don't know if they're, <laughs> this isn't Yaya Milwaukee. I mean, just... so, <laughs> so, so I appreciate that. It, I guess, you know, I, I'm going to close it up because, you know, uh, again, Anybody listening? Well, first, Aaron has has a podcast, and is it what's what's the blog? Captain Capitalism. Blog is Captain Capitalism. Yep, Captain Capitalism at blogspot.com. Okay. Uh, the podcast is the Clary Podcast. You can find that on SoundCloud. I think it's on iTunes too. We give it the RSS feed. Yeah, so those those you can find up. But I mean, if you search Aaron Clary, after all the hate sites, you'll never <laughs> right. find one that's my own. You'll find the original out there somewhere. So right. Right. I, I remember I had I had a, an interview I did with someone uh, about the NSA and freedom of speech and whatever. And, and we we're kind of and, and I started to get all these these kind of hate posts on my YouTube. And I was telling my wife, I'm like, hey, people are finally like recognizing the blog. There weren't That's, any death threats. So that was a good thing. But when you get then you're a pro. <laughs> Once you get death threats, you're a pro. Then you can call yourself a blogger or a podcast, whatever. But yeah, you need at least one death threat. But read through these saying, hey, yeah, somebody actually responded. But um, but yeah, so so, you know, my work is uh, is at I mean, I don't have anything published yet. I do have a, a contract with a publishing house, Roman and Littlefield. I was fortunate enough to have David Opst as my agent. Uh, he was the agent for Bob Woodward of Woodward and Bernstein. Oh. I worked with him on a school intruder film. Uh, that we co-directed last summer. Just a, just the weirdest thing how that developed. I was brought in as a content expert and then quickly elevated to co-write this. He re, he did Revenge of the of the Nerds. Wrote really? That, oh, uh, that's fat, okay. Fast Times uh-huh. at Ridgemont High. Um, all the presidents men's and the guy's a blast. He's like you know in his seventies now, and we just hit it off. I mean, w- at one point he said to me, he said, "I I wish we would have been." working together at a time when we could have done this together as a career, like for 30 years, because we just yeah. get along and I had nothing to lose. It's like, it's not my, this is a side gig. I mean, it's not sure. my, my income. So I'm like really easy going. And, uh, and anyway, he said, you know, I told him I'm, I wanted to pitch a book and he said, well, I've got some ends yet, you know, and, and I used to be 
an agent, so I'll be your agent. And he just kind of did that for me, helped me get this get this deal worked out. Um, and the only thing is, like, it's due September first, so I've been scrambling now of, of pulling. Oh, you got plenty of time. Sense. You can do that. And, uh, I wrote I wrote a 400 page book in three months. You can do it. You just need a security guard job that you work at <laughs> night, and then you can bang it up while no one's interrupting you. I, I you know I've learned Aaron through Fiverr. I've I've outsourced some of the data work, like some of the data sets, mm-hmm. um, and and so I've had people who have been doing that, you know, for like 55 dollars um, and, and giving me pretty reliable information. Like I need to know the demographics of the people of Floor Manhattan. Um, in 2001, and I need mm-hmm. to know their income in this and this and this, and I need you to like, you know, give me some comparable points across the U.S. and and you're know, like, okay, for 55 bucks I'll do that. I'm like, that would sweet, you, there you it is. Know, Take care, yeah, boom, you done. It. You got it, buddy. Uh, so um, again, Aaron, you know, we we talked today, reconnaissance man. Please consider purchasing it. There are other works that Aaron has out there. You can get and explore those. Uh, Poor Richard's Retirement for Everyday Americans. That is so vital. So vital. And cheap. Very cheap. Really? Very cheap. Yeah. It's like it's only like 120, 130 pages, and it's like okay. five bucks. Yeah. So it's yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So um and and yeah, and again, um, you know, Aaron really does a thorough job in developing his work. And working with um, his his Jim Fear, um, what yep, is Jim it? does the audio. Yeah, yep. Jim, Jim Fear one thirty eight blogspot dot com. That's his site. Uh, yeah. uh, incredible. I mean, as you're listening to that, it, it is uh, you know you can just sit back and get immersed. And Jim does it is so professional in in the audio. Um, and again, listen listen to his podcast and to listen. I, I mean. Aaron, you know, podcast 100 of yours is my favorite when you, when you do the, yeah. <laughs> the imitations out and see it. I'm not going to get into it any more than that. But I'll All right, see, you. now i got to write it down. Podcast 100. Podcast 100. Number 100. All there right. Was, there was a, a, like a five-acre plot in, in Seattle where they were going to turn it into a community garden. And then, and then you took on the persona of, of, uh, of, of store owners as they're approached on this. Of like, oh, you know, okay. Try- All right. Nah, it's, none of this is coming to me <laughs> now. I got to to like, to do. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, it was, it was, yeah, it was, it was almost a crash statistic on I-90-94, you know, at that point, because I'm just <laughs> laughing so hard. But yeah, I mean, you're right, you're right on with that. And then, you know, and, and owed out to Adam West when you're, you know, you're talking to, you know, about the whole Batman thing in, in the one episode of like, you know, why do we have to have, you know, such precision specifications on, you know, the, you know, the, the, the bat boomerang William or whatever. Prime it Adam, yeah. yeah, it's not like William Prize. Why is this yeah. so specific? It just is. It just, it just is. is. Just no do it. it. It just is. So, um, but I mean, your humor, but your message is there. I mean, it's relatable. And I think especially if you're a, a, a male, um, you know, and I don't. It's male skewed. Yeah. And just to warn it, your listeners, it is it is a, a rated R podcast. There's lots of cursing in there. It's 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 a, a locker room talk podcast. Yeah, it, it is. It is a locker room. And you do also do a a largely curse free. Uh, I try to. Yeah. <laughs> Whether I succeed or not is uh, another issue. Some slip through the, the hockey uh, goalie there. But, yeah, I try to do a curse free. But I, but I, I think what what you talk about is what resonates in a lot of, of minds of 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 people, especially men out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it just, it, it is something that's part of my weekly listening. I go in and download your podcast. Um, and I, I appreciate the work that you do and just your dedication that, you know, you've, you've stayed with it. Um, you're willing to take on topics that other people aren't willing to take on. And I, I, I think you have so many people aligned with you. Of course, they're not overtly going to come out and, and, no, and no, pledge their alliance or anything like that. But, but um, again, you know, listen, if you're listening to podcasts, uh, you know, I would say listen to, you know, five, eight, ten podcasts to, to really kind of get the picture of what Aaron is is communicating. Because Apparently really podcast builds. number 100 is the one everyone has to listen to. So that's, that's I, I'm, I'm telling you, Aaron, your your impersonations in 100. I, I don't know where it was, but there's a segment and I had to hunt through because I lost it when I was. I had it, you know, I was listening to it and I didn't know like which podcast it was. And you've done now what, like, you know, almost 200 well, plus. Yeah, 250 <laughs> if you include so, the curse free. Yeah, we're up there. So, yeah. of course, you know, I'm having to sort through like every, and then suddenly like I'm just playing it and it comes to that. I'm like, write it down, you know, like pull it out and write it down. I'm like, so it's like, 
and, and, and tears, tears are rolling out of my eyes because I, I could just visualize this and, and the way you brought this to life. And oh my goodness, it was, it was so funny, but yet driving home this point. So again, today, you know, we've, we've been uh, here on the Safety Doc podcast. Uh, we've been interviewing Aaron Clary, economist and author, so much more. Um, I Again, Aaron, I'm appreciative for reconnaissance, man. I enjoyed it. Thanks for putting the time into that. You know, so many people start work, they don't finish it. Then, you know, the, it was just, it was great. I mean, it, I, 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 I'm glad it. you liked it. I, I liked it. You know, and I'm 45 and I'm not 18, and it still resonates with me and meant a lot to me. And I'm thinking too, my daughters, when they get to, you know, be 17, 18. Yeah, give uh, it to them. Absolutely. And, and the dad approach I'm going to take with that of saying, mm-hmm. you know what? I want you to go out to here, 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 and here. I'm not going to hold you back. I'm not going to do that transference that was done to me of saying, don't get the car with the sunroof because it's going to leak and all your stuff's <laughs> going to be wet and all of that stuff. I'm not going to do that, you know, because of because of reconnaissance, man. And, and poor Richard's retirement. And who better? I mean, your work in the financial industry um, I know you know you gave the red flags of the housing crash well yep. before that was going to happen. Well before, um, and, and would have made a lot of money, yeah. more money if I just went along with it. <laughs> just, just shut up and oh, yeah, make those loans, baby. Yeah, <laughs> just your you know your everyday ad- ad- advice on that and your wisdom. So that, you know there's much there's much wisdom contained um, you know in what Aaron has to share. So uh, again, Aaron, anything in, in closing uh, before we we wrap this up? No, just thanks for having me. I really appreciate it being on the show. Yeah, I, I, I had a good time. I had a good time and uh, and really, again, appreciate the work that you've done. Um, this is part of the 405 Media. Now, uh, Aaron and I have, um, for the time being. We know being, John Clint. Yeah, we know J.D. Yep. We have J.D. and we have a back-to-back podcast, even though I've, I've emailed J.D. a few times and he still has me listed in the 1 o'clock spot, although I've aired in the 2 o'clock spot for a couple of weeks. So, you know, I, I'm the... Uh, I'm the lead up band to, to the, the big band. Oh, the big band. You know, Aaron East Slayer, you know, like I am, I am, you know, the band that played at a few County fairs and I come on and and now we're at Summerfest for the big time Summerfest. People are going and getting their popcorn and, you know, you know, they're, they're getting their Budweiser and everything like that and kind of figuring out where their seats are going to be. You know, that's when I'm, that's when I'm up playing. And then, you know, Aaron comes on stage and, and everyone, everyone's ready to go. So Aaron, again, thank you for your time this, this evening. And, uh, This uh, podcast uh, is going to help a lot of people. So thank you very much for all of your work. All right. Thanks for having me, David.